Right. Okay, so uh, I'll give you a brief overview in a minute, but just uh, so I'll try and keep it as general as possible. I realize that some of you know a lot about malaria, but others probably don't. So in general, it's a parasitic disease of blood. There's lots of it. Uh, lots of people have it. It kills about 2,000 people every day. Most of those are kids in Africa. There are five species, well, there are six actually, because Ovale is two. Five species that infect humans, but it's falciparum that does most of the killing, not all. Vivax does some. Um, and whereas talks years ago were always incredibly pessimistic, in fact, in the last decade, just over a decade, uh, there's been a substantial improvement in malaria. And we think that since the uh, new beginning of the new millennium, about 3.3 million deaths have been saved, have been prevented. Uh, and that's mainly by deploying insecticide-treated bed nets, which stop you being bitten by infected mosquitoes, repel and kill those mosquitoes, in some places spreading insecticides, and a radical change in policy from using drugs that were completely useless to using drugs that were quite effective. And that has had this, I think, enormous effect. Most of the... So this map just shows you where the biggest uh, changes um, have been. And uh, you can see that in this part of the world and over that part of the world there's been quite a lot. In Africa there's been less improvement in some areas, particularly central parts of Africa, often areas where, where with problems with conflict. Um, and those, prob those problems are going to continue for some time. The other, I think, major change has been one of attitude. We did try and eradicate malaria before in the 19... 50s in 19 well after immediately after the second war second world war there was a lot of um, uh, uh, benefits and advances from uh, funded by international governments rockefeller foundation and so on which eliminated malaria from north america eliminated it from europe and from russia and it, this this gave uh, rise to optimism that perhaps we could eradicate it from the whole world and in 1955 the world health assembly endorsed the global eradication campaign and it failed Often pe people say that it, it, uh, it failed to eradicate malaria, but it was successful in eradicating malariologists. And after that, uh, there was really a period of rather of despondency and what, what was euphemistically called containment, but was actually a failure to contain malaria. So malaria took advantage of that and came back big time. And resistance emerged to the insecticides and the drugs. And by the 1970s, the, there was a clear increase in mortality. And by the 80s, uh, that mortality was accounting for several hundred thousand, if not millions, of deaths each year. That additional mor mortality from the, ra the return of malaria. So, towards the end of the 1990s, things changed. We had the formation of the Global Fund for HIV, TB and Malaria. So, money started to come in. Bi really substantial increases in funding. I'll show well, I won't show you that, but there's a been approximately tenfold increase in, in funding. And the word eradication, which had been a dirty word before, uh, suddenly came back into usage when Bill and Melinda Gates, somewhat surprisingly in 2007, de declared that the not inconsiderable resources of their foundation would be, not entirely, but substantially divert, uh, devoted to trying to eliminate again. And they were quite realistic that this was not going to be easy and it would take decades, not years. So, can we uh, eliminate malaria if we are losing the drugs? And probably the answer to that is no. So this is the overview of the talk. I'll uh, just give you some relief ideas about drug resistance, uh, a particular threat at the moment of artemisinin resistance. And artemisinin, this Chinese herb-derived anti-malarial, is the best anti-malarial drug we've got. It's extremely safe. It's more potent than anything we've ever had before. But as has happened twice before, and I'll show you this, resistance is now emerging in Southeast Asia. One of the misconceptions is that you're either sensitive or resistant as a parasite, and it's not like that, it's shades of grey. Um, and the resistance we have so far to artemisinin is not complete, it's partial. So the drugs still work. The main conduit for such information, of course, is this one of the leading medical journals here, which announced that a new killer bug had been discovered, and this killer bug was artemisinin-resistant malaria in Western Cambodia. Artemisinin resistance emerged in Western Cambodia, which was exactly where Chloroquine resistance had emerged. Chloroquine, by the way, was our best anti-malarial drug of the 50s and 60s, a really, really good drug. 
and chloroquine resistance had emerged in this area here of Western Cambodia. And the epicenter was a town very near uh, the border with Thailand, famous for uh, sapphires, and more recently infamous for being the headquarters of the Khmer Rouge. And chloroquine resistance had emerged there, and also resistance to the drug that came next after chloroquine, which was a drug called sulfadoxine pyrimethamine. Often people know it by, as the word fancies are, which was its trade name. So twice resistance had emerged there, and now, for a third time, were signs of resistance. And what we were seeing was um, that graph at the bottom there shows you time along the horizontal axis, and along the vertical axis is a logarithmic scale of the number of malaria parasites in your blood. And you can see that there are four lines, uh, two of them where it's going, the numbers are going down fast, and that was from uh, Francois Nostin's research group, part of uh, Moru up on the northwestern border of Thailand, so that's the Thai-Burmese border, and here is western Cambodia, close to the Thai-Cambodian border, and you can see there's a clear difference. And what we were seeing was that the parasitemia was going down more slowly in western Cambodia. And the key pharmacodynamic advantage of these drugs, the artemisinins, is that they kill the circulating parasites. I don't want to do too much technical detail, but they, they produce very rapid parasite clearance, and that's why they are better than all the other drugs, that's why they save lives. So this advantage seemed to be lost. A little bit of boring stuff now. So just to point out that resistance isn't uh, a black and white process, it's often shades of grey. What it represents, you can go to sleep if you're not interested in this bit, this is uh, dose response or concentration effect relationships. Resistance always means that the curve moves to the right. It could be a parallel shift, it could be a change in the shape of the curve. So we were seeing, and, and that results in malaria in, uh, we, can, we can rephrase that or reformulate that as probabilities of a parasite surviving. So when the drugs are really working well, the probability that any parasite would survive is very low, and as the resistance levels increase, the probability that the parasite survives increases until really the drugs don't work at all. So the R3 line up there would be a very high level of resistance. We don't have that yet. What we have is a sort of this sort of a level for the artemisinins. Now, artemisinins are interesting because they are very rapidly eliminated from the body. And the Achilles heel of some of the other drugs, so we don't use artemisinins alone, we use them in combination treatments, so-called ACTs, or artemisinin combination treatments. And we partner these very rapidly eliminated drugs with much more slowly eliminated drugs. This is weeks here, so you can see that some of these other drugs, mefloquine, chloroquine, pyrimethamine, they hang around in the body for ages. In fact, there's some newer ones too, uh, like lumifantrin, that's the orange one here, or piperaquine. So they hang around for ages, and we put them to, the two together in an artemisinin combination treatment. But this long half-life is a weakness because it encourages the, the spread, but not the emergence of resistance. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Another point is that as resistance uh, increases, and it's a technical point, uh, the effective half-life shortens. That has implications for the rate at which uh, the resistance spreads, but I won't go into that in too much detail. What I'll show you is this cheery chappy who won a Nobel Prize. He, uh, he was an, a Viennese neuropsychiatrist. We've had three Nobel Prizes in malaria. Ross for discovering the parasite, uh, for discovering the mosquito transmitted the parasite, Laverin for discovering the parasite, and Wagner Jaureg for discovering that if you gave people with neurosyphilis malaria, I know some of you get malaria, but you get it for money. These people got it for <laughs> neurosyphilis. And it benefited them substantially. In fact, malaria therapy became the treatment of choice for neurosyphilis. And neurosyphilis was very common. About 10% of everybody in mental hospitals in, in Europe and North America had neurosyphilis. We called it the general paralysis of the insane. And about a third of them were cured. And the other, another third were benefited by giving them malaria. So malaria became the most studied infection of human beings. And thousands of people got it. And in the course of that, we were able to do extraordinary things like test the emergence of resistance. And it became very clear that it was possible, very easy to select resistance if 
you had a lot of parasites exposed to a little bit of drug. And this, for example, is a drug is pyrimethamine, which I've mentioned before, just to show that it was very easy to select resistance in people. And this is another drug, which is all similar to pyrimethamine, called probe guanil. Don't bother about that. All it really shows you is it's very easy to select resistance to some drugs and actually quite difficult to select resistance to other drugs. Why that is, we might discuss. The, wor the most vulnerable drug of all, I think, is a drug that probably some of you have taken if you've gone to a malarious area called a tovaquone. It's part of malarone. And if you treat malaria with uh, a tovaquone alone, one out of every three people that you give the drug to will have a failure of that. Will the infection will come back. It comes back around three or four weeks later, it was always there, but you couldn't see it for most of the time. The patient got better initially, then there was a period when they were fine, and then they had a recrudescence. And that parasite now is highly resistant. In fact, it's 10,000 times less susceptible than the original. So a single point mutation, single genetic change in one gene makes this parasite go from completely sensitive to completely resistant, which means that one in three people had one of those parasites in them when you treated them, which tells you that the frequency with which these viable mutants emerges is around 1 in 10 to the 12. So there are two aspects to resistance, and we won't get bogged down too much in technicalities, but there's the rare time, the rare event when you actually select for the first time a resistant organism, in this case a malaria parasite, and then the process whereby that uh, resi those resistant parasites spread to other people. So obviously they won't spread if you don't select them. Got that? Yeah. So here, what are the factors that determine this process of de novo selection? Low dosing. So when you expose any microorganisms to not enough drug to kill them all, you will select the more resistant parasites. You've got to have a lot of them. So you can imagine bits of antibiotic going into the sewage system, a little bit of antibiotic, tons of bugs, great way to select resistance. Uh, and in a human, in uh, much of the world, you are not just infected once, you're infected many times. So you develop immunity to some sort of, it's rather a poor immunity. I know half of you are developing vaccine that's going to make it much better. Um, and hopefully in another 2,500 years we'll have that vaccine. <laughs> but in the meantime, the, uh, it's, the, what we have naturally is not very good, but it does, provide, does act as a break on the, on the de novo selection. And then we have the process of spread once you've uh, actually got that, and that is related to this long half-life. That's not relevant here. It is relevant there. And also, I, won't, I haven't got time to go into what that means. So, what are we going to do about this resistance? Well, we haven't got any really alternatives other than the ACTs. They're the best drugs, but people say, well, you can't use an ACT to, to, to eliminate malaria, which is caused by resistant parasites. Well, you can actually, if this still works. It's pretty simple. And we really don't have any uh, alternatives. So I'm going to say in a minute what we might do about that. So just to <coughs> su summarize the bit about resistance before we go on to the specific problem of drug resistance in Southeast Asia and what might happen about it, just a few misconceptions. Continuous chemoprophylaxis doesn't select for resistance. Everybody says it does. It doesn't if you take it properly and the drugs work. Long terminal half-lives they enhance spread, but not de novo selection. And increasing anti-malarial drug use will inevitably re lead to resistance. Not true. It, it depends really how you use the drugs. And that's, for example, WARN is very much about trying to get people to, take, to use the drugs properly. Improper use is what selects for resistance, not proper use. And the real, these are the real villains, not giving the right doses. And we systematically underdose, for example, young children. We assume that young children are just like older children or adults, just, but just smaller. At least that's what my observations are. They're smaller, so therefore you should just give them the same milligram per kilogram dose. Not true. Actually, as you may know, those of you who work on animals, that you give them much larger doses than you give humans. So the allometric scaling is inappropriate. Just use milligram per kilogram doses. So we've got to get the right doses. And very importantly, we have to deal with these two different problems, both of which contribute enormously to resistance. Substandard drugs, there are 600 different registered formulations of ACT in Nigeria alone. I can't believe that all 600 of those are really good. In fact, I strongly suggest that many of them are useless. And that's 
enormous problem in the developing world. Counterfeit drugs, another enormous problem. Uh, two years ago, half of all anti-malarial drugs in the private sector in Cambodia were fake. And uh, that was the main source of the anti-malarial drugs. 90% of anti-malarial drugs came from the private sector and half of them were fake. Disastrous. Let's go back to Southeast Asia, which is where I live and work. Um, and this is Palin, some time ago. And this was the first time that resistance emerged. This is the Faculty of Tropical Medicine where Nick Day and I uh, work. And chloroquine resistant falciparum malaria described in Eastern Thailand, but probably emerging from Western Cambodia. And in the early 1960s, 1963, uh, seven members of this famous entomologist's uh, research group were studying in the forests near Batambang, and they all came back with malaria. And the malaria that they had wasn't just chloroquine resistant, it was actually resistant to a number of different drugs. In fact, resistance had appeared to be multi-drug resistance, so resistant to chloroquine, that's one class of drug, progranol, that's another class of pyrimethamine, Mepocrine, resistant, multi-drug resistant malaria was prevalent in many areas, not just in Cambodia, but in Malaya as well, and in Colombia, by the early 1960s. And the only drug that did work in those days was the old-fashioned gin and tonic, the uh, cinchona bark quinine. And that resistance spread. It spread, first of all, uh, into India, then it marched across the Indian Ocean. It arrived... Uh, on the eastern seaboard of Africa in 1978, and just marched across the country, uh, the continent, sorry, and by 1992, uh, we had chloroquine-resistant malaria in West Africa. And that is at a cost of millions of lives, not hundreds of thousands, millions of lives. And it happened again. So if we look at the successful uh, pyrimethamine-resistant parasites that have emerged in Africa, we can see that they have their genetic origins. I won't go into what all this means, but the, we can see that those genes actually came from the Southeast Asia. So the flanking, if the, techni the, te the techies in you, the flanking sequences around the DHFR gene were identical to those in Southeast Asia. So those successful parasites that transmitted anti-malarial drug resistance in Africa, killed African kids, came from the same place. Why? Well... They are funny parasites in Southeast Asia, but we also did some funny things. One of the things that uh, we did, not me, although it might, might, uh, I was alive at the time, but I wasn't doing it. One of the things that uh, was done was, uh, in a rather misguided attempt to treat everybody, was to add um, anti-malarial drugs to salt. And so everybody was exposed. And for example, in the, in the Palin area of Western Cambodia, they added one, they distributed one ton of chloroquinized salt. Now, that's a single observation, single point. So, you know, all those scientists amongst you realize that you have to repeat the experiment. So they then added, and then added, uh, they made a, a ton of pyrimethaminized salt. And that resulted in those chloroquine and pyrimethamine resistant parasites. So this uh, rather misguided approach to malaria control was actually done in quite a few areas and undoubtedly contributed, but probably wasn't the only cause, definitely wasn't the only cause, of anti-malarial drug resistance in many areas. So if we come fast forward a little bit, we come to the time that I arrived in Thailand in 1980. At that time, chloroquine had died. It really was useless now. You had very high level resistance. If you gave somebody chloroquine with falciparum malaria at that time, which some people did, no response at all. Sulfidoxin pyrimethamine followed. That died uh, really rather quickly. And there was a small interim period when quinine Q was used. And then in 1984, uh, mefloquine was deployed. Mefloquine had been developed by the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Interestingly, Jing Hao Su had come out of the Vietnam War Ho Chi Minh asked Zoin Lai for help. So that led to Jing Hao Su. The other side was developing anti-malarial drugs. The American Army developed mefloquine. And actually, mefloquine was deployed in 1984 in combination with sulfidoxine pyrimethamine, which was completely useless. So strangely enough, that didn't work to protect the mefloquine. And by 1990, mefloquine resistance was really bad. 
and increasing the dose from 15 milligram per kilogram to 25 really didn't do much good. So we were looking at a rather unpleasant uh, situation of potentially untreatable malaria by the end of millen the millennium, and we were saved by the artemisinins, these amazing Chinese herbal drugs. And artemisinin combination treatment resulted, despite combining them with mefloquine, which was not doing very well, we actually had a remarkably successful uh, treatment that remained above 90% cure rate until in the late 2000s. This is the northwest border of Thailand. And then, uh, back to the beginning, we started to see resistance in Cambodia. Why? Well, uh, several things, really. Uh, the Cambodian had been using artemisinin since the Khmer Rouge time. In fact, our colleague and friend, had, Professor Lee Jo Kuo, was one of the people that provided the Khmer Rouge with artemisinin. So they've been using them ever since. They've been using them in all sorts of ways. This is fake. Um, you could take one or two tablets. Even the Thai government, I'm afraid, gave people one or two tablets. It was badly used for about three decades. Uh, Cambodia was the first country, by the way, to deploy ACTs at a national scale. Um, so we had, Artem we had artemisinin resistance in, in, in Southeast Asia. How far had it spread? And it is really rather analogous to cancer because uh, it obviously has to start somewhere. And if you can get it out quickly, eliminate it, then you can stop it spreading, obviously. But if you wait, and uh, as you will see, the main strategy has been to have lots of meetings and not do anything, that will lead to the cancer spreading. And the problem is that as you, if you're still having drugs that work and having an effective control program, as you drive malaria down, you sort of distill the, few, the parasite, the numbers go down, things are looking good, but of what's left are the most resistant parasites. So the last man standing uh, is the most resistant. And so you have an opportunity, whilst malaria is still coming down, still, if the drugs work, to eliminate. But once it starts to come up again, that tells you the drugs are no longer working and it's now too late. And so far, we're still there. So far. So the first question is how far or how extensive is the spread? In the night, in the about seven years ago, we thought it might be, or even five years ago, we thought it might be uh, confined to uh, just western Cambodia, which interestingly is a land island in terms of malaria. There's no contiguous uh, malarious area around it. So Thailand, apart from the border areas, is malaria-free, so it couldn't go west. This area is more or less malaria-free. There's a lot of malaria up here, but that is an in independent land island. So it seemed possible that you might be able to just get rid of it in western Cambodia if it hadn't spread. Now, the comparator group in that New England Journal paper was the northwestern border of Thailand. That's Mela refugee camp. And since 2001, uh, the, this research group has been doing incredibly laborious and tedious studies in hyperparasitemic malaria. So people with lots of parasites doing six hourly parasite counts. And that allows you to look at parasite clearance rates and we can express that as a sort of half-life. So the longer the half-life, the slower the clearance. And this is time, you probably can't see it, but you can see that uh, this line actually is drawn at 6.5 hours. This is what Cambodia looks like. So these are the very resistant ones up here. And you can see that actually you've got a few dots above this line going back, well, that's about 2005. So although in general it looks sensitive, there were some really worrying signs that resistance actually uh, had, had spread or emerged independently in that area too. And if you look at the proportion, this is what this graph shows, the proportion of, of people who've got slow parasite clearance, you can see it's going up exponentially. This is Cambodia by, by comparison. So perhaps artemisinin resistance had already spread. It looked strongly as if that was the case. In fact, that trend continued and now we started to see a precipitous decline. They've really gone off a cliff. The, the efficacy of our main treatment for malaria has just gone boom. In, the failure rates have gone up 10 times. So, what are the prospects for the future? 
Um, just want to emphasize that whilst, even though all that looks really bad, as long as the, if the drugs are still working, you still have a, an opportunity to intervene. But that window is closing. That's what I mean about the window of opportunity. And really, you know, the, the, the clock is on. So, what might happen next? Carry on, carrying on. That's the current approach. Lots of meetings. Or do something radical, uncomfortable. Do things that people don't like to do, particularly if you're, everything's going, you know, if you and your kids don't get malaria and all you do is go to meetings and your funding's gone up tenfold, why, why would you want to do anything about it? That's slightly cynical, and it is. So these things are a little uncomfortable. They would require moving outside the comfort zones of the malaria control programs, the Ministry of Health, activating ministries of defense, mobilizing civil society, border controls, perhaps treating everybody across the border. Difficult things. The sort of things that we considered when we thought we were going to be invaded by bird flu. Why? Because it would affect you and your families. That's why you're willing to go to do it. It doesn't affect you. It just affects poor people in rural areas. It doesn't matter. So what WHO said is we've got to stop this. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> and we are going to do that using a combination of malaria control and elimination measures. What they did not say was how they were going to do it, how we were going to do that. And we still haven't decided how we're going to do it, even if we're going to do it to try and do it at all. So how are we going to eliminate malaria in this area? And can we do it without treating everybody in the endemic area who's infected? And if we are going to treat everybody in the endemic area who's infected, how are we going to identify them? Does everybody carrying malaria parasites uh, come to the hospital or the clinic and say, I'm ill? And the answer is they don't. And in fact, we have an iceberg of malaria where even in low transmission areas, and this is the new finding if you like, even in low transmission settings, a lot of people are walking around perfectly well with malaria parasites. So if we use standard rapid diagnostic tests, microscopy, our sensitivity doesn't look very good, down to about there. If we use small volume PCR, uh, we could probably get down to of the order of a thousand parasites per mil of Do you know how much blood you've got in you? Anybody any idea how much blood you have in you today? Five five mils? <laughs> bit mean. So five thousand mils. So if you multiply five thousand by a thousand, you can see that even with a reasonable PCR, we've got five thousand times a thousand, five million parasites in our circulation. That's just about the limit of detection. If we take enough blood, which nobody does, because everybody loves to do a little finger prick and put it on a filter paper, uh, and this involves taking a proper amount of blood, we can get down probably even as low as 10 per mil, which would mean that we could detect somewhere of the order of 50,000 in your blood. And they only live in the blood, that's the advantage, at least for most of the time. Five axes excluded from that. So when we looked in these places where it's supposed to be low transmission, it's supposed to everybody's supposed to be ill if they have malaria. What we find is that there's a lot more malaria than you think, and I'll whiz through this. So if you did a standard screen, rapid diagnostic test microscopy, you might find that, that the red one was parasitemic. If you used a standard filter paper, capillary blood spot, PCR, you'd say that, but the truth is that. In fact, the truth may be that they're all red. So actually, there's a... how. How on earth are we going to uh, treat these people if they're not coming up and presenting as ill? And just for clarification, quite a lot of them are carrying these resistant parasites. <coughs> Mixed infections with PCR and that much. Half of IVAX. But if we're, these, are, these are resistant parasites. How are we going to get rid of them? Well, some time ago, we suggested that the only way to get rid of them was to treat everybody. Everybody. With drugs. So-called mass drug administration. And uh, I won't read this all to you. We had a meeting. It was a very unsatisfactory meeting, in my opinion. Um, it says... I can't remember. However, all the participants that agreed, actually, one, with one exception, with one, that was me, one <laughs> exception, all participants agreed that MDA should be considered only after certain research. My view was we should go right now. This was a really serious problem, it required emergency response, we hadn't got time to faff around. But faff around we did, and uh, the border 
still looked like it was there. And then in the last four months, there's been a major scientific breakthrough. Ha <laughs> um, So obviously the interest was, you know, if you're going to really define resistance, you have to, ident you have to identify what it is in the parasite that makes it resistant. The phenotyping in humans is blunt, not very accurate. We need to identify the genetic basis. We had evidence that there was a strong genetic basis because we were able to look at uh, identical twin or related parasites in different people. I won't go into all that, but because the transmission is very low, you often get the same parasite in a number of different people. And two uh, genome-wide approaches were used. They were different in, 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 in the source of the, of the isolates and different in their methodologies. And they both identified something somewhere on chromosome 13 as being strongly related uh, to artemisinin resistance. So the first one was Tim Anderson's, uh, uh, and this is uh, the GWAS that Chris Plough and colleagues at the University of Maryland did. So two flags went down on chromosome 13, and the French decided to look in the middle between the two flags, and they found a molecular marker, which this is Institut Pasteur, Frédéric Carrier, who was actually ran the IP lab in, in Phnom Penh, and then went back to France, identified this thing, the Kelch protein, as being a suspect. They, they, they selected resistance in a Tanzanian isolate, not Tanzanian rather, not East Southeast Asian. They got eight mutations in seven genes. One of them was slap bang between these two flags that had been put down. So they looked there and they found that mutations in this gene correlated with an in vitro test, which was a reasonable marker of resistance and more importantly correlated with the phenotype. This is wild type, fast clearance, these are mutations, slow clearance. Two very interesting features. One is multiple mutations were involved, not just, what, not just one point, but many different, but only single, never a double. Maybe the double was too unfit. And these mutations were all in what's called the propeller region of the Kelch protein gene. Where we're mapping now, and actually on Friday, Nick and I are going to have a conference call where we discuss, see how, find out uh, how far we, how far towards the border up there in India. This is famous in the second, the Japanese got as far as there, and it's about, that's about as far as the parasites have got so far. Uh, we're piloting elimination, I haven't got time to say all the details, but we've done small scale. We now want to actually examine whether it's possible to scale up mass drug administration. It's a very difficult thing to do, it's highly controversial. This is, part, this is the Thai Burmese border, and these are areas where uh, we will or hopefully um, start eliminating. Is it too late? I don't know. So this is the current strategy, and uh, <laughs> we're hoping that that might change. I don't know. If it doesn't change, uh, we're going to measure our failure in hundreds of thousands of deaths. And on that cheery note, I'll finish. <laughs>